I um, want to make two comments. One is uh, I'm doing this Sunday school lesson uh, primarily out of uh, some concerns, also out of uh, not a real great deal of preparation. I'm actually on vacation, but Sean had asked if I'd come in and fill in. Um, and so uh, I'm going over some uh, information that I went through with um, my church some time ago. Uh, also trying to get two hours worth of lecture into one, so the pace may be a little bit fast. Um, but I want to try to... I, I spent an hour developing... Uh, the view that I want to critique and another lesson critiquing the view. So I'm trying to really skim the tops of the mountains, so to speak, today. Um, but I chose this topic for a number of reasons. One, I'm very passionate about the issues of creation and I, I suppose some would probably uh, accuse me of being rather myopic uh, in my own theology. Uh, it is the area that um, I love uh, tremendously and I have some deep concerns I share that with the session as many of you may know we have uh, in our presbytery entered into a debate about what is known as the animus imponentis a Latin phrase for the mind of the church uh, what has prompted the debate has been uh, a concern by a number of us in presbytery that um, our standards are being sort of loosened, uh, at least in terms of a practical approach to them. And the debate is centered around, does the confession as it was written and adopted by the framers, is, is their understanding of the doctrines what is the mind of the church, or are we to somehow look at the um, proclamations of General Assembly and the voice of the modern church as the mind of our standards and the church and the debates rage over, over those issues. At the vortex of this is really the creation issue. I don't think it's limited to that, but we have uh, particularly views coming out of our reformed seminaries um, that are um, denying what, what many of us believe to be clearly the expression of the Westminster Divines in a literal six-day creation, 24-hour or ordinary day length, six sequential days. Uh, that is in our presbytery the, the big debate. Now, most everyone is a literal six-day creationist in our presbytery, but many are, I think the majority are seeing that other views are within the bounds of, of the confession. Um, more and more, um, the minority of us are becoming <laughs> a bit more concerned about that. Your pastor and the other members of the session uh, are, um, and myself included, are in the min minority. But I want to share with you some of the things that we are concerned about and try to help you to see the mentality or the mindset that has, is driving this. And I want to focus today on the framework hypothesis, which was the view of creation that I was taught at Westminster um, in Escondido. It was popularized by um, Professor Meredith Klein. I don't know if that name means anything to you, but many of you may be familiar with him. So I want to briefly outline his understanding and some of the things that bring him to those understandings and then critique that. With that said, you ought to know that um, the framework hypothesis, in my estimation, has taken on sort of a new, uh, a new set of clothing in a view that has become popular by um, the, prof the uh, president of Westminster West, uh, Bob Godfrey whom I have a tremendous amount of respect for him. I just respectfully disagree with his understanding of creation. And uh, that view has become known as the, the analogical view. And we have in our own presbytery um, had uh, an individual who came out of that seminary and was, um, was actually applying the analogical hermeneutic not only to creation, but to the rest of scripture, which became very problematic for a number of us. 
and uh, we were able to work through that thing thankfully but i think we see some of that that anticipated fruit of certain premises certain foundational thought that goes into uh, interpreting scripture and where it leads. Um, I was accused of making some of the arguments that uh, the implications of the framework had far-reaching uh, disastrous ends um, and I was accused of well that's a slippery slope and I think we're seeing more and more some, some of the fruit of that. I think uh, Godfrey was well-intentioned to try to clean up some of what are some perhaps more obvious mistakes and errors in uh, Meredith Klein and tried to couch that in um, in Van Tillian language. Um, Cornelius Van Til, again, very capable scholar and I have tremendous respects. I consider myself Van Tillian. Um, so, um, but by putting this um, this monster in different clothing, I still think is a monster in different clothing. Uh, the Lord used that illustration in, um, in referring to uh, false teachers as uh, wolves in sheep's clothing, that we can change the outward appearance, but inside the, the thought and, and what's driving this and the conclusions uh, are still very problematic to me. So that's what I want to try to accomplish today, and I know it's a huge amount. We're already 10, 12 minutes into a one hour uh, thing, so uh, I'm going to go ahead and, and try to get through this. I've got a grid on the board. The framework hypothesis um, Framework hypothesis, um, no, no pun intended. <laughs> These are the days of creation. Basically what, uh, what Meredith Klein sees is days uh, one, two, and three have a corresponding uh, second table, so to speak, with days four, five, and six. This is sort of the framework. Uh, on day one, we have a uh, God creates the light and we have darkness. And what Mer Meredith Klein calls this table here are the kingdom realms and over here are the kingdom rulers. Okay, kingdom realms and kingdom rulers. So we have the realm of light and darkness on day one. And then on day four, we know that God creates the sun and the moon. And they rule over the day and the night, right? Uh, what happens on day two? Does anybody have all this memorized? What, what do we have on day two? I, I was going to read through the text, but I'm going to let you just go back and do all this study, otherwise we'll never make it through this. Day two, we have the uh, firmament or the expanse. Firmament, I'll just... And we have the waters underneath that firmament. In the firmament, God sets the luminaries, the stars of heaven. He creates on day five the birds of the air and we have the fish of the sea and all of the other sea creatures. So here we have the waters, it's parallel uh, ruler, the fish. We have the birds of the air, the firmament, which is the heavens, which we have the birds of heaven and so forth. So here the birds are in that. So here's this corresponding uh, thing. On day three, what do we have? We have the land that appears. We also have vegetation that, that comes into play, don't we? The green herbs, the plants that become, uh, become a part of that. Then in day six, we have all the land beasts. And of course, we have the crowning creation in man. Okay, so he would say here's the land mentioned and we have the beast, the realm. Okay, that's basically the structure of the framework with a Sabbath day that's treated separately, which is an eternal e -T -E -R -N -A -L, eternal rest. Okay, that is uh, basically what we find, the, the language of morning and evening 
mentioned on days one through six, but there is no morning and evening, so the Sabbath uh, rest, which speaks of our eternal rest. Okay, there are some things that we want to familiarize ourselves with in, in Meredith Klein's view. When he looks at creation, he's not looking at just chapter one, however. If you notice, day seven is uh, treated in Genesis chapter 2, 2, 1 through 4. So, or 1 through 3 in the beginning of, of verse 4, we should probably leave this at 3. 4 becomes sort of the transitional period. And then we have um, Genesis 2, 4 and following where we have a uh, another treatment of creation. Um, uh, in Meredith's view, or Mr. Klein's view, uh, this is what we call chronological recapitulation. Or in other words, we have in chapter 1, we have events about creation, and then we go back in time in chapter 2 and we readdress that. And now we have another creation account in chapter 2, 4, and following. The structure, he would argue, is thematic, uh, akin to poetry. He would not call it poetry, but he would say it would be akin to uh, for memorization, that uh, the, um, the days are not sequential. He does not find these. These are, are put in themes that we want to think about, light and darkness in one uh, event or one, one set of uh, literary device for learning but the two triads kind of as the organization here, but they're not sequential. Um, he argues they're snapshots of literary, liter, um, not of literal days, but of figurative days. Um, they are a literary device for us, um, not intended to tell us how God created, but that God created. Um, it's not designed to give us that, uh, that um, minute detail of how. He sees... Uh, Genesis 2-4, which uh, you have yours open. Can, Kathy, will you read Genesis 2-4 so all of us know exactly what's there? This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God had made the earth and heaven. Okay, so these are the creation, are the generations of, right? That's the, um, the first of ten of these, this phrase, in the Hebrew, Ela Toledo, these are the generations of, right? And it's the account of creation. Now the question becomes, is Genesis 2-4 an ending statement that refers back to chapter 1 through 2-3, or is it an introductory remark that brings us into what follows in Genesis 2-5 and following? Does that make sense? So the language he uses is a superscription that it, uh, is it leading us into, uh, as a beginning and introduction, into uh, two five and following, or is it a colophon that it's the end statement? Yes? How is it used in the other? You're jumping ahead. <laughs> Hang on. <laughs> Hopefully I, I should answer that question. We'll get to that. So I'm trying to get you to see how he dresses. He treats this as a superscription. In other words, that the verses that follow about the fall and so forth, what happens in the garden, that this, Genesis 2-4, is sort of an introductory. This is the account of creation that now um, we're going to look at. That's the how. Now, when he gets into that, of course, we see that he, he gets to the, um, the very next verse. Kathy, do you want to read verse 5? Now no shrub of the field was yet in the earth, and no plant of the field had yet sprouted, for the Lord God had not sent rain upon the earth, and there was no man to cultivate the ground. Okay, so here's a problem. No plants in the garden. And the reason given is that God had not sent the rain. Meredith Klein wrote a, a world-famous essay that uh, was published uh, entitled Because It Had Not Rained. And what Meredith Klein argues is that there was no herb of the field. It had not grown up because 
uh, or no plants in the garden because there was no rain. And so rain is necessary for those plants to come. And so the conclusion of that article, though there are many arguments that come in, the conclusion is that God is operating by ordinary providence. That it must rain in order for plants to come up from the ground. So ordinary providence. You want to tuck that in the back of your mind as well. Um, he argues for long ages are very possible. Um, primarily because of what he sees as gaps in the genealogies. Um, I want to leave you two quotes. Again, rem remember that Meredith Klein is defending that his view is exegetical. It's driven by an understanding of the Hebrew text. He's drawing out these truths. And these are the conclusions he gets by looking at the text. The blessing is that he happens to get the modern science with his view. Uh, long ages to the earth and so forth. Um, so um, he sees the um, apparent gaps in the genealogies and so because there are gaps in the genealogies, uh, Meredith Klein, much like some of the, uh, the uh, modern geologists, uh, interpret ages in, in between the layers, so to speak, in the rocks. Uh, he sees gaps in between the various uh, patriarchs and so forth. So this is how he maintains that uh, there are, are potentially very vast ages to creation. I want to uh, read two quotes, though, how, uh, that I believe. These came right out of my uh, tapes. I taped the classes and copied down his quotes. I'll, I'll read them as he said them. There are a couple places where uh, his verbiage, he kind of stutters a little bit, but um, I think you'll get this. And I think here we see evidence that he, uh, much to his own denial, is that he says he is not pressured by science and he's not trying to accommodate modern science. But here, um, in terms of um, dealing with the gaps in the genealogies and the question of the age of the earth and more particularly the age of Adam, uh, in class, uh, he answered the question, how old does he believe that the earth really is, and when was Adam uh, born? He said this, and I quote verbatim, I admit I would feel very uncomfortable if this elastic had to stretch all the way to include something like Lucy, back one and a half million years BC or something who probably is actually an ancestor of a pygmy chimp chimpanzee rather than man anyway. If you were holding that that was Adam, I would have a problem stretching this thing a million or two million years as a date for Adam. But I, for myself, don't have a problem with stretching it, if necessary, to 100,000 years, if indeed necessary, if indeed it is necessary to accommodate the ev evidence for Cro-Magnon man. One, one other quote. Adam, depending on how you understand the evidence for Cro-Magnon man and Neanderthal, and what their relationship might be to one another and to Adam, and depending on how you come out on that sort of thing, certainly Adam is tens of thousands of years BC, conceivably 100,000 BC, because there's no telling how big the gaps are. When I heard these things, I literally, you know, my jaw is dropping on the floor. Uh, a complete betrayal of everything he is saying with his mouth. He's not trying to accommodate certain evolutionary uh, scientific enterprises. And so his long ages, I would argue, uh, really come out of, I think, potentially a a pressure from that sort of thing. So let's try to uh, unpack some of the problems or some, give you some refutations for this type of, of, of view. Um, let me make one comment before I get to that though. In terms of the analogical view, it's essentially the same structure with the exception of the language uh, that is typically adopted is in terms of God, as Van Til um, argued, is that all of our knowledge is analogical, that we, we don't know any fact like God knows. 
that God has divine understanding, we have creaturely understanding. He knows every proposition infinitely. Uh, we only know things uh, by way of creatureliness. We have sinful, uh, we have sin that attaches to our thinking and so forth. So we only know God is love in an analogical sense. We don't know it when God says, I am love. He knows more fully and uh, with divine understanding uh, that all the truth behind there that we, we don't know. And it's not just a, a quantity of knowledge, but it is also a qualitative aspect to that knowledge. And so uh, that then becomes sort of the driving language to this is that we don't know any facts like God knows them. So we can't understand creation like God could. So we have to understand it in terms of an, an analogy. And that becomes sort of the wedge that we get to drive all of these sort of concepts into. So that's why I say that I think it's couched in terms of uh, different language, but the, but the substance really is the same. Uh, Godfrey was a, a defender of Meredith Klein and so forth, and so I, I, um, I uh, think that that's uh, some, of the, some of the driving force behind that. Anyhow, we're going to have to refute this, and we want to start by recognizing what the confession tells us about good and necessary uh, inferences and consequences and so forth, that we want to address these by way of sound reasonings, looking at what Scripture says, letting Scripture interpret Scripture and so forth, and bringing to bear the conclusions of sound reasoning to those, to those uh, studies. So when we look at day one through four, and if you look at the language in Scripture, you'll find that here is probably the best case made. And it's no wonder that Meredith Klein in our class spent about 80% of the time drawing the parallel between day one and four. Because quite frankly, that is a very tight comparison if you buy into the presuppositions of Meredith Klein. Day two and day five begin to break down slightly. And I think day three and six have a tremendous number of problems. So I would say if in terms of time, probably 80% of the time on day one and four, 19% of the time on day two and five, and 1% of his defense on where he ever even dealt with day three and day six. So let's try to give you some of the challenges that are here. First of all, um, in day uh, one through four, or day one and four, Part of the challenge that Meredith Klein has is that he says, I cannot conceive of light apart from luminaries. And so, if I can't conceive of light apart from luminaries, <laughs> there's a problem. It's sort of an autonomous reasoning, uh, not an exegetical thing. We have to take at face value what God says. I think the organizing principle that, that I'm more persuaded by is the idea that God is bringing a, 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 a realm into existence. He's bringing his world and the heavens into a defined order. And that comes by way of progression. It's uh, chaotic, it's dark, it's void. And God is bringing definition and light and, and clarity to uh, his created order. So... Uh, the light and the darkness that we uh, were not privileged, no man was alive, at least on my view, seeing sort of this chaotic, uh, undefined creation coming to definition uh, and a progression in that, in that order. More complex, more order being brought to and this being sort of sequential unfolding of uh, the chaotic and undefined to its crowning end through a progression. So while there is a parallel in themes, uh, the light and the darkness as a realm, certainly they may be realms, and certainly we have the command to, to rule over the night and the day. So there is uh, a... Uh, a mandate there on behalf of God. Okay, so 
that I would say there are some challenges just in terms of we can't conceive it. Well, no man ever saw it, so how can you, how can you define it? Nobody was there to even witness it. But God was there, and if God says it was chaotic, it was <laughs> formless and void, then um, we have to take his word for that. The second um, parallel, the firmament or the expanse, as some of your translations will say, that are the heavens and the water. We have the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea. Uh, one of the challenges that comes in this is that the birds and the fish are never told to rule. They are told to, um, to be fruitful and multiply. Uh, incidentally, the, the, the command to rule is the, as the dominion mandate. Have you heard of that? That God commands the sun and the moon to, to rule over. But the birds and the fish are never commanded to rule over them. So that's missing. <coughs> Funny thing, uh, Lee Irons was presented with that particular absence by Ken Gentry on one occasion. And I remember the rather humorous... Uh, uh, reductio ad absurdum by Ken Gentry on this occasion is he said, well, the birds and the fish don't, are never called to rule over the, um, the heavens and the, uh, the seas. Um, and Lee Iron's response was, well, the, uh, the be fruitful and multiply as part of the dominion mandate, thinking that he had solved the problem. But he created an infinitely greater problem in my mind. If being fruitful and multiplying is part and parcel of the dominion mandate, then what are we to do with the rulers of the sun and the moon? Are they commanded now to be fruitful and multiply? <laughs> you see the problems that arise. But I digress. Um, Okay, so um, the other is we have the luminaries, actually, I didn't put this. The luminaries, uh, the stars are put into the firmament at this point. And the birds certainly aren't in space, so they're not in that particular area and not ruling over that space either. So there are some, some other challenges that come at that point. Um, Let's see, the, um, and there aren't luminaries in Earth's atmosphere either, which could possibly be leveled as an argument, though I wouldn't put much weight on that. But day three and six I find very problematic. First of all, the plants appear on day three. Now, I would say if we're going to get thematic and so forth and we want to be analogical, I could see where God is trying to establish that life appears on the third day anticipating perhaps the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. I wouldn't press that, but I'd say if we're going to go that route, that might be a better conclusion. But, but what kind of a realm is a plant? Are those actually realms? That's not an area. This is life coming. And then you press people who hold to this view, and I, I challenge them with that. And they say, well, that's just to anticipate this other triad here. But wait a minute, but it defeats what God is trying to say. Is that a mistake? No, no, it's just anticipating. I think, well, that's because there's a progression, you see. And, and this, I believe, God has given to us as a, as a great, you know, challenge to this view. Incidentally, the framework hypothesis was not... Uh, conceived by Meredith Klein. He popularized it, but it was actually defended by a Swedish liberal before Meredith Klein got a hold of it. So it comes right out of liberalism, and you ought to know that. He's cleaned it up a bit, but, uh, but this, is, um, this is the seedbed where this view came from. Meredith Klein was teaching E.J. Young's class while he was on sabbatical and uh, brought this to the attention of the students, and it was through studying uh, this liberal's work. Okay, um, let me see. There are a couple of things I wanted to put out here that um, we also have the, the beasts, the land beasts and man separated as far as distinct creations, but the, the land beasts are never told to rule. We do have man told to rule and to be fruitful and multiply. And so... If that's all part of the dominion mandate, again, that gives us the problems that we had mentioned earlier. 
I think maybe this will help you to understand uh, where you're going. Okay. Uh, has there ever been a uh, debate prior to uh, Mary's plan on the uh, hypothesis there? And two, uh, is this an OPC in house debate? Um, this is the view that. Well, let me. Uh, there's a number of questions. One is, has, have there been debates? First of all, let me ask that. Uh, Dr. Pipa did debate. Uh, uh, um, why am I drawing a blank on his name now? Um, uh, Mark Futado at Westminster. Meredith Klein would not enter into the debate on it. But Mark Futado at that time, while he had fought against Meredith Klein in the early years, ended up becoming convinced of his view and began to defend it and I know uh, on that occasion uh, Dr. Pipa and Mark Furtado debated. I'm not aware of Meredith Klein debating the issue. Um, Meredith Klein's posture in class was pretty much um, I'm going to go through my material and I don't want to be bogged down by questions. Um, though he would entertain a question or two from time to time, it was very rare. And a number of people wanted to hear what he had to say and tried to respect that, but he was not real warm to questions in general. Um, and certainly far more hostile to uh, debates. Just didn't uh, find that as a, a profitable ground for, for him. Um, okay. Um, and so I would argue that there is progression in this. As far as the eternal rest, the, the challenge here is there's no language of morning and evening. So therefore, it can't be a literal day is the argument. And if this day is not literal, then how can we argue that all of these days are literal? And I would argue that <laughs> there's many reasons for that potentially. But I believe, in general, that to argue that way is really to have the tail wag the dog. Because you have six examples of mon morning and evening established. There's your rule. And the rule ought to govern the exception, not the exception governing the whole previous six days. And so, logically speaking, I think that's a, a fallacious uh, argument. Uh, the other reason this may be uh, different, and you might know when you read Exodus 20, of course, there's a, a pattern for our work week that is established upon God's work week, that he labored six days and rested one, therefore we are to do the same. I think that would argue for literal, ordinary days. Uh, however, in Hebrew, Hebrews 4, there is an eternal rest that we anticipate. And it's possible, I don't know what Moses had in mind, but it's possible that he left it vague for the very purpose of showing us that there are, um, there are other aspects to this. When you read Deuteronomy and read about the Sabbath, there the Sabbath is attached to our redemption, not to creation. It's interesting how Moses changes there. And so it, he kind of, in those two accounts, gives us both aspects. Now that may be what's in his mind. I won't go to the mat on it. I don't know what was in his mind. But I think just to have it not there does not undo what is here in establishing the pattern. So I would be critical at that point. Um, okay. Um, uh, Meredith Klein argues that uh, the days themselves can be long days. Um, the word yom in Hebrew functions very much like it does in, in English. Uh, we can say, um, you know, I'll see you in six days, and we know exactly what somebody means by that. Six days from now, on Saturday, I'm going to see Pastor Dave. If I were to say, well, my grandfather's day, now you realize that I'm talking about a period of time that my grandfather lived in. And the Hebrew word yom functions very much like that. And you ought to know that. Uh, even in uh, the text that we read, in the day God created them. There's a use of yom that is not a literal day. And Meredith Klein's reasoning is, well, because it can be uh, a long periods of time, um, probably doing an injustice to his reasoning by bo boiling it down to it this crass way is that um, therefore I'm going to take it that way. 
Um, that's my take on how he argued the case. Now he gives you verbiage and he gives you reasoning, but I'm not persuaded by any of it. What I am persuaded is in the studies that have been done in the Word of God that, that take together the body of uh, usages of the word yom and we find a very distinct pattern that emerges. When the word yom comes in connection with an ordinal or cardinal numbers, do you children know the difference between an ordinal and a cardinal number? It's a cardinal number and an ordinal number. An, an ordinal number we have a uh, first, second, third, and fourth, and a cardinal number as one, two, three, and four. You'll notice that we have in the creation account both cardinals and ordinal numbers. We have on, the, uh, on day one, and then we have second day, third day, fourth day, fifth day, right? So in, in the creation account, both occur in conjunction with the Hebrew word yom for day. When we look at scripture and we attach the words for, uh, actually just in the Old Testament, the, um, the, the number 1 through 7, or, or the um, first, and then say uh, the 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7. When we attach those, the words that appear in creation account, there are 139 examples of those constructions. And every one of them is absolutely literal as literal days, with one exception, and that is in Hosea, where, the, um, where he will raise us up on the third day. May be a non-literal uh, reference there. But overwhelmingly, they are literal. When Yom does not have a number attached to it, it may be either literal or non-literal, much like in my grandfather's day is a, is a period. When I say the other day, I may be referring to a specific day. Um, so you want to understand that. So I think the pattern in scripture clearly argues that the days here with the numbers attached to them should be seen in terms of literal uh, numbers. Um, what is the length of the days here? Um, uh, actually, was there anything else I wanted to say here? Um, well, al also the, 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 the attachment of morning and evening in singular, I think, also is another layer to this to argue that they are ordinary days. Um, the length of the days. What's the passage that we go to typically? I'm going to run over and grab my Second uh, Peter 3.8, probably a familiar passage. If somebody has it, they want to read it real quick. Blurt it out if you've got it, just for time. But do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. Have you heard that before? Yeah, so how, how long is a day in the mind of God? Is it a thousand years? Two things about that text. First of all, it does say that one day is as a thousand years, doesn't it? But it also says the opposite. A thousand years is as one day. So what is it? How long is a day in the mind of God? I would argue that text does not tell us. In fact, that text is telling us something far different. It's saying that God's not bound by time, as man is. And that what may seem like a very long time of suffering for the saint, don't be discouraged. That's just nothing but a day in the mind of God. And God, in a moment, can turn around our circumstances. But now let's read another passage, one that has never entered into the debate that I wish was employed more. And I encourage each of you, when you get pressured by this, to use this one. John 11, 9. You can memorize this because it's just the opposite of, of emergency. Uh, 9 one, one John 11, 9. Um, if somebody has that, go ahead and read that real quick. I've got it right here. And Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble, but he sees the light of this world. For if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. Now there he defines a daylight period as 12 hours. 
I'm wondering why this text is missed in the debate. In the mind of God, here's a text that tells us how long is a day in the mind of God. Um, so anyhow, put that in your theological pipe and smoke it. Um, okay, there's another challenge to this. The gaps in the, in the genealogies that Meredith Klein wants to assert are there. Um, one of the things that I think has been very helpful by Dr. Piper is recognizing that there's a, a vast difference between the genealogies and the chronologies in Genesis uh, 5 and uh, 11 and so forth. In terms of the genealogies, when we read Matthew, a genealogy, we have the various sons that are there. And sometimes maybe a grandson is mentioned who is treated as a descendant of somebody and potentially there could be a gap there. These are the gaps that, that Meredith Klein wants to drive these vast ages through. But when we go to Genesis and we see when Adam lived so many years, he had these sons and he died when this, he was this old when he died. He had this son at this point. This son then gets picked up. He lives so long, he has sons. And we can mark with precision how long the families are, marking the birth and death and when, when sons were given and so forth. And we can trace that. That's a chronology. It gives us the timeline. And when we do that, there are no gaps <laughs> to speak of. If they are, they are minute. They are not these vast eons, hundreds and thousands of years. Uh, so know the difference between a chronology and a genealogy. Um, some of the language in here, and you're going to miss this because you didn't have some of the defense either in my class or here of the language. But um, when, uh, when we have sort of the summary verse, uh, the, the debate is in Genesis 2, 4, is this looking down or is it looking up? Is it a, is it a colophon or is it a superscription? Um, and I argue that it serves sort of as both. If we look at Genesis 5, 2, for instance, we have the same, same language. These are the generations of, of uh, Adam. And Adam is mentioned above, and then we have a genealogy or a chronology of Adam listed below. And so the these are text that sort of adds kind of a summary or an introductory thing actually sort of works like a hinge or an hourglass, if you want. It's sort of the pinch in the middle of the hourglass, that it's not serving one function or the other per se. Um, when you look at all of Meredith Klein's arguments um, for, uh, I'm running out of time. <laughs> I've got a hundred other things to say to you. Let me give you, I think, one of my most uh, definitive arguments as far as what goes on in, in this treatment and the biblical refutation. And that is that every element of the framework hypothesis that is defended as the structure and to try to deconstruct literal sequential order of ordinary days, I believe, is refuted by the very same author to um, the, the very same author of Genesis who gave us numbers. And when we look at numbers, particularly numbers seven, we have, in my estimation, one of the greatest refutations. Because number one, it's written by Moses. Number two, the context of number seven is that it is the dedication of the temple. And what we have at the dedication of the temple is a list that gives us... I don't know if I got all these right or not, but 12 days. Twelve days, and each day we have leader number one who offers up a sacrifice on day one. 
And that sacrifice, let's say, is an A, B, C sacrifice. So many gold pans and so forth. On day two, we have leader number two goes up and he offers A, B, C. Number three offers his A, B, C, and on it goes ad nauseum through 85 verses through 12 liters, and you're just thinking, okay, I get the point. But it is exactly the same offering. It is repeated 12 times. You have at the end of that, these are the offerings that were offered up, and then you have a recapitulation of 12 times A, 12 times B, 12 times C. You get it, a restatement of what was stated before. A summary verse, sequential days. And nobody looks at this and says, this is not to tell us how the offerings were. It's not to tell us some sort of way of memorizing the information, but a sequential order of ordinary days and every component is here and far more reason to argue repetition and structure and order for it being a literary device written by the same author and I don't know how you escape it. And so I feel like that text invalidates everything that was said before. And I could go on. I think this is a text that has missed a number of people's minds. But I don't believe that we've got an answer to the Genesis problem. I don't believe this offers us anything that was not far better stated in our Westminster Divines writings, in their work, in the, in the confession that we have. And now when somebody comes and embraces this, and uh, they're asking us to ordain them. I'll tell you where I stand. I don't necessarily mean, believe that this, somebody who, who comes out of Westminster holding to this view is a heretic. I don't believe that. I don't agree with it. And if that's all there is, I may not have problems. But what I find is the thinking that goes into this structure is off the mark. And I don't believe that it really is sound exegesis. It doesn't offer us anything. And I think when we do look at some of the scholarship of the day, and Machen himself said that he believes that the Christian faith is capable of scholarly defense, we don't want to diminish the work of scientists. But we have to carefully examine the presuppositions, the assumptions of the scientists, what the premise is, what their world view is, and understand are they doing their science for the glory of God? Or are they doing it for the glory of Darwin? Or atheism in general? And so um, I believe that there are good things being done in science, creation science, we're making great strides. And I'm not ashamed to be a literal six-day young earth creationist because I believe the evidence is in. And I believe we will see the myth of old ages being dispelled in our time or shortly after. But until then, we have to be sharp and, and address these things. Um, again, I have a dozen more lines of thought that go into this. Our time has, uh, has disappeared, but I hope you can understand that we're not just trying to be uh, a wrench in the spokes of the OPC. But we believe there are serious issues that are involved in this. And implications to take in an analogical view of creation that sets a weak foundation for understanding sin is literal, Adam is literal, a literal speaking snake and so forth, and literal days of creation and so forth. Greg? Yeah, thanks Dave. I think that's, that's very helpful. You began, though, by mentioning the animus and, infinitus. And I was wondering yeah. if in a very short few minutes you could yeah. put this together with that and explain the situation that we're facing. Yeah, great, great observation. I had intended on doing that. The issue that has driven the debate on the animus 
comes out of um, an, a report of the General Assembly that, um, that defended a number of views of creation, literal six-day framework, analogical, day age, and so forth as potentially viable views and that there were a certain number of tenants that had to be held um, and seeing this whole panoply of views as within the realm of orthodoxy, essentially. Uh, and so that becomes now the motivating pressure behind presbyters who are trying to say that anyone who votes for a candidate who doesn't hold to a literal six-day view is in violation of that report and has violated the animus of the church. Another aspect of that is what is the animus? What is the historical view? Machen and uh, Warfield, who um, neither of them uh, believed in a literal six-day view. Um, so, and they were certainly uh, leaders in, in our denomination. Uh, so are we going to keep them out of the denomination when they did not hold to a literal six-day view of creation? I think there are arguments there um, that I would say uh, in light of modern uh, work and uh, in light of where they were, I think they are coming out of a time when Darwinian evolution was taking the world by storm and I think further they had m much bigger issues on their plate to deal with. And um, again, I won't say somebody's a heretic who doesn't hold to a literal six-day view, but it's problematic and I think the hermeneutic if it's applied is going to be far more dangerous and so we need to define are we going to say um, you know that the GA report is the one that we need to be moved by and that's the mind of the church or do we take the original um, uh, the, the confession in its historic understanding and, and allow that to be the issue and then how do we interpret that um, and so forth those are the debates so I don't know if that's answering your question. I think it is, yeah. But I mean, the bottom line is that uh, presbyters would not be free to vote their conscience if the General Assembly has decided a certain thing. They would have to agree with that, come what may. Right. Um, the other, the other side that is, it's almost frightening to hear the comments that have come from the floor of presbytery at times, where um, if somebody holds to orthodoxy in creation, we're bound to vote for them simply because they're orthodox in, in, you know, according to that, st that standard where the reality of the vote in this one instance that I, I have in mind, um, I think in most of our minds it wasn't just creation that was a problem. Creation was a problem, but it was the application of the hermeneutic to th the rest of scripture. Uh, what do you do with the Sabbath, marriage and divorce and other issues? They're all going to be debated down the road. Here I am, a prophet again, saying what the you know, slippery slope. But, but um, right now, it's the Sabbath issue isn't the real big issue, or even marriage and divorce. Who knows what the next issue is going to be? Right now, it's creation. But where does this go? And this is why we need to uh, de deal with this now and not just allow history to con perpetuate a, 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 a wrong way of handling this. Yes, Bridget. Well, no, uh, not necessarily. Um, typically, in well, in the OPC, if you take views that are outside of the confession, see, I think we're failing to say, will you take an exception to the confession if you hold this view? The GA, the GA report is basically saying you don't have to take an exception to the confession if you hold this particular view. Um, I would argue it is outside of the confession. So. Um, if the GA report is seen as the animus, then we can't say you're outside the confession. We can't force people to say it. And then they would have the freedom to teach this in the churches as a legitimate view of scripture. Well, uh, well, in my view, yes. Now, if you ask somebody who holds it, they're going to say, I'm not a heretic. I'm just, you know, I love you guys. I'm, you know, <laughs> you know very orthodox men have, have embraced this. You know, otherwise orthodox. You know, you know, just coming into the church and you're teaching that, mm -hmm. that's going to be God's word. 
Mm -hmm. Right, and that's the danger. That's where it becomes sort of, well, I'm going to be more consistent than my teacher because he, he really needs to apply this principle here and here, and I can see that he didn't. And that's how it gets more pervasive through the rest of the doctrines. Yeah. <coughs> okay, we are at 10.30. Is that a hard break? <laughs> okay, do you get one more, Tom? Uh, I, I, uh, I don't know what you're trying to prove and if uh, Mary Pye says that he could take the age back to 100,000 years, he wouldn't have a problem with that. Uh, is there some, somehow that uh, dinosaurs were alive? Then we could say, we could prove that they were there existed way beyond 8,000, 9,000 years ago. There's not, I mean, I don't know what they're trying to prove uh, other than that they disagree with, uh, you know, Genesis 1 and 2. Are they trying to prove something? Well, I, I don't know. Um, like I said, my, my suspicion is that, you know, men, when you read liberal literature, these guys are not these country bumpkins who make a really sloppy argument. These guys go through details that most Christians absolutely just miss, quoting out of texts that are you know, fragments of manuscripts hidden in some archive somewhere where they're, they're pulling up uh, things that has a, um, a, a real pressuring aspect to it to people who read that and say that the depth of work here is, you know, noteworthy. Therefore, it must be true. Um, and I think, you know, you read uh, Bart's commentary on Romans. I mean, you, you can see that this while it's poisonous, it's not just a fourth grade level, you know, work. It, it is, I hate to use the word scholarly because I do think scholarship is attached to truth, but it is academic. Uh, and, um, you know, he said when it was published that it was going to fall like a bombshell on the playground of the theologians, you know, and it did. Um, and I think that's part of the pressure. And so when Meredith Klein reads this Swedish liberal, I could see that uh, maybe he's very persuaded by it. And particular, uh, you know, one, one comment, another quote, he, uh, he actually uh, said that uh, the Institute for Creation Research down in San Diego was a diabolical institution. Quote, diabolical institution. His words, not, I'm not trying to malign him. But when I hear that, you see a, a bias in the man. And I'm thankful for, for ICR. I don't agree with everything that's come out of ICR, but they've done some tremendous work. Um, so if you, if you are <coughs> claiming that as the heresy and, and you're wowed by the scholarship of lit liberals, you can see why somebody would embrace that. And I don't know that it was malicious. I don't think he's trying to disturb the peace of the church intentionally. I want to believe what's best about him. God knows his heart. I don't. Um, all I can say is I, I'm not terribly impressed with the fruit. Okay? Enough? Said? Okay. <laughs> all right. Let's pray.